galaxies in the universe. In every way, an ordinary galaxy. It's a hundred thousand light years across. Inside this huge swarm is one average size star. As stars go, it's quite unremarkable. Nevertheless, it's the most special place in all the cosmos. Orbiting this star is the only place we know in all the universe to harbor life. Summer clouds drift above it, driven by ocean currents. All of it is wrapped in a delicate cocoon of air that shields us from our star's radiation. Three brave explorers are about to leave the safety of Earth. They are an American, Terry Burks, a Russian, Anton Scaplero, and an Italian, Samantha Cristoforetti. Their mission, six months in space to study microgravity, do biomedical research, and observe the Earth. They're sealed inside this tiny metal cocoon, a Russian Soyuz spacecraft traveling at 17,500 miles an hour. Their destination, the International Space Station. It was built in orbit by 16 countries. It's a research lab, training facility, and observatory, all powered by the sun. A truly awesome example of what we can achieve when we work together. Launch. Dude, that was a pretty wild ride. <laughs> Butch describes the crazy scene. As I watched Anton, I mean, he was thrilled and, and doing flips and excited, floating around, hitting the ceiling. <laughs> Samantha, the look on her face, just absolutely thrilling. It was literally electric in the room. It was, it was fabulous. Samantha recalls her first ever view from space. But I just couldn't resist to take a peek. And I could just see the, the Earth majestically flowing by, and it was like a river. And, you know, I, I, I don't know what, what happiness is, but I was definitely happy at that time. Cupola is a magical window, unlike any other, on the spectacle of our Earth and ourselves, past, present, and future.
What I always found especially moving were the passes where we would fly uh, from the Atlantic and then fly over Gibraltar onto the Mediterranean. And it was almost like I was doing this journey that, you know, you know, travelers from legends and myths in the past had dreamed of or, or performed in the reverse way, right, from the Mediterranean through Gibraltar, which, you know, once was considered the end of the known world. More than 500 years ago, explorers rounded the stormy tip of South Africa. As an omen for future trade, they named it the Cape of Good Hope. At the same time, the glorious Caribbean beckoned with the untold riches of the New World. Aboriginal people came from Asia more than 30,000 years ago, bringing their spiritual ties to this land, the continent we now know as Australia. The Maori people from Polynesia traveled thousands of miles in tiny canoes across the Pacific Ocean before they reached New Zealand. Home to the ancient Inca civilization, the longest mountain range in the world, the Andes. They stretch 4,500 miles across some of the most extreme climate zones on Earth, from ice fields to deserts. The oldest and driest desert is the Namib in Africa. You can see our climates from space. The Great Lakes of North America lie trapped in ice and snow for more than a third of the year. You can also see evidence of Earth's violent past. Asteroid impacts have left scars on its surface. This crater in Quebec is 62 miles across. The Earth is still active. Volcanoes tear through its surface. The Kamchatka Peninsula in Russia has over 100 of them. Now Terry Birds describes his experience. One of the most beautiful things to see from space is thunderstorms at night. And there are certain parts of the Earth, Central Africa especially, but also Southeast Asia. There are just amazing amounts of thunderstorms. You see thousands of flashes per minute. An unbelievable amount of power. When you think about a giant lightning bolt going off near your house and how loud it is and how that scares you and the dog runs under the table. Well, when you see it from space, there's so many of these things happening at the same time. It's truly amazing. You see power. A funnel 25 miles in diameter of the center of a hurricane or a typhoon, and you go, oh my. Typhoon Mysac was amazing. I've never seen anything like that. The eye was so big, so well defined. Then you realize that that's energy, and it is power, powerful energy. Far above the storm, every drop of water is carefully rationed. There's no showers in space, so there's no, you can't just go under the water and let it run. It's just kind of wet towels and wiping down. But you can get pretty clean, and washing your hair is not too bad. In principle, we want to recycle all the water, which means that the urine gets recycled, but also the, you know, your sweat, um, all the humidity from the air, which is uh, recuperated into the system via the air conditioning system, um, also gets recycled into potable water. It's not a 100% efficient system, so we do have uh, water bags on the space station as well. The SpaceX resupply ship, called Dragon, arrives from Florida. It's one of the first commercial craft to bring up supplies. It brings food and water and equipment, and without that, we wouldn't be able to live for more than a few extra months on the space station. But on Earth, 
we kind of don't have any supply ships. It's almost like a mission to Mars when you're not going to get a supply ship. You have to pack everything with you. When we're all doing cargo ops together, I mean, it is organized bedlam. It literally is crisscrossing, people flying, packages flying, going here and there, and you have to get them in the right place. But you can't put it in the wrong spot because you'll lose it. You won't be able to find it later because there's so much, literally thousands of items, and you can't remember where you put every single one of them. That's why we have to have this database. We lost a 14-inch torque wrench, and it was gone for five weeks. It just floated off, I guess, and went in some little nook and cranny somewhere, hit itself, and it finally it reappeared one day. I like to sleep floating, so I did not attach my sleeping bag to the walls at all. Um, and especially at the beginning, I would just like close my eyes and let myself float and just fall asleep. Butch and Terry are getting ready for a spacewalk. There are a lot of complex systems on the outside of the station, and sometimes they need fixing. If you want to go outside, of course, you have to survive in outer space this suit allows you to do that. So Butch really fills out the suit, <laughs> but it also means that when you're trying to put the suit on or taking off, it's quite some work. Getting out of the hatch is an entire operation in and of itself. You have, we have so much equipment on us. Uh, your backpack tends to bang into the hatch or your helmet wants to bang into the hatch. You walk around by grabbing onto things with your gloves. Almost 300 degrees on the sun side of the space station. You get in the shade, it's minus 275 degrees. You feel that inside the suit. My fingertips in the sunlight would be like I could feel them on fire almost. Um, from the fatigue a little bit, but also from the heat coming through on that sun side of the orbit. So I'd have to, you know, I'd kind of curl my fingers at times and put them in the shade a little bit and let them cool down. Okay, buddy, we'll take them. You can lose where you are on station, so you're always thinking you have a safety tether attached to station. It's on a reel, like a, a fishing reel type thing with a spring that always reels it in. You can be upside down, twisted, inverted, and completely lose your, your, your spatial awareness about where you are and what your attitude is, and you can easily get tangled up in that safety tether if you're not cautious. Every single movement you make, you're making a, an effort to think through it. The outside of the space station is not just a sidewalk, it's a jungle of wires and equipment and metal bars and trusses. Well, if you accidentally sliced your glove or your spacesuit on one of those sharp edges, that could create a leak. And if that leak were big enough, you would die. The hardest thing during a spacewalk for me is getting out of the hut. And so the, the only way that we found to actually get a boat to come out of the upper torso of the hut was for, for me to basically push and shake and push and shake until he finally was able to free himself from the suit. Holidays in space were great, but to be honest, I missed home. Of course, we didn't want to leave Santa hanging. If there's somebody that you don't want to make mad at Santa Claus, so we put the milk and cookies in the airlock. We, we weren't sure exactly how he would get in the space station, but we assumed the airlock would be kind of our equivalent of a chimney, so we thought that would be a good place to leave the milk and cookies. I speak three languages. I speak English, Russian, and Tennessee. As you're learning Russian, they say the first 10 years is the hardest. <laughs> That's a fact. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, the day arrives, boom. 
and it's time to go home. The Soyuz spacecraft is ready to take Butch, Sasha, and Yelena home. And of course, you're looking forward, you're coming home, your, your wife, your family have been away from from eight months. Derek, Samantha, Anton, make us proud. But of course, the people that you're leaving behind too, you spent six months with them, and, and it's a very melancholy feeling because the, the hat shuts and they're gone. And you realize that part of your life is over and you're not gonna have this same fellowship with those people ever again. And it's, and it's, it is a sad feeling. See you, bud. I kept joking that he wouldn't be qualified for his flight unless he came with me to my hairdresser to learn how to cut my hair. Of all the things we do as astronauts, this scares me the most. For the crews that live on the station, one of the most important things of all is being able to see from day to day what we down here on the ground can't see so clearly. What is happening to our Earth and how we are changing it. We began with a home of lush green forests, animals, and plants. With more and more of us to feed, we began clearing the land for farms. But when you cut down the trees, there are other losses too. Great forests once covered much of the island of You can see how many of them are gone. Without tree roots to anchor it, the red soil oozes downhill, clogging the rivers and vanishing into the sea. Unique animals like the lemurs are losing their homes. The great rainforest in Brazil continues to disappear. It's home to nearly half the species found on Earth. In just four decades, almost half a million square miles have been cut down and burned. From space, you can see huge smoke plumes stretching across the rainforest for hundreds of miles. Thousands of species up in smoke, forever lost. As the forests burn, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases spew into our atmosphere. We've always taken our fresh air for granted, but we know now that the fossil fuels we burn also release clouds of pollution into the air we breathe. They fill the atmosphere with gases that cause the climate to change. As a result, the Earth's temperature is rising. In California, it's affecting our most precious resource on Earth, water. Seeing California is beautiful from space. It actually looks like a giant ice cream scooper went right down the middle part of the state and scooped out the Central Valley. But it's very brown, and you can really tell there's a drought going on and that they could probably use a lot of rain. In efforts to save parched crops, we used groundwater, so much of it in the last 75 years that parts of the valley have sunk 30 feet. The life of ranchers and farmers depend on water rights and who can take what water out of which river. Even cities like San Diego, Los Angeles, and Phoenix depend completely on their access to water. The Colorado River Basin supplies water to 40 million of us in seven states. The reservoirs that make this system work are losing water at alarming rates. They need huge amounts of runoff from snow to feed them runoff has dwindled in recent years. California's reservoirs could soon be dry. I had never seen the Himalayas at all. 
and the immense size was just, oh, it was, it was mind-boggling. They just went on for hundreds and hundreds of miles. In the shadow of Mount Everest, several of the Earth's great rivers begin their journey across the Indian subcontinent. They provide water to drink, irrigation for crops, a place for worship. But now, the rising temperatures are causing glaciers and snow high on the plateau to melt. The water supply of over 500 million people is now threatened. By the time the rivers reach the Ganges Delta, they've become pipelines for all kinds of pollution pouring into the sea. But problems like this can be solved, and when we work at it, sometimes we succeed. When I was a kid in the 70s, uh, the Chesapeake Bay was a mess. And the fish and crabs were disappearing, and there was a big restriction. You couldn't fish for rockfish and other types of fish. It's been cleaned up and, and in a few decades' time. It's a beautiful place now. It's thriving. That's a great success story of, of conservation. It's a giant universe out there, but there's nowhere like Earth. It's a beautiful planet. We have air that we can breathe, we have water that we can drink, food is there for us. We have this life support system that's like perfectly designed to support billions of humans, and it's pretty amazing to see how much effort we had to put into designing and building the space station. But what if our surface water disappeared altogether? This actually happened on our neighboring planet, Mars. Unlike Earth, Mars doesn't have a magnetic field. Without any protection, its atmosphere was ripped away from the planet by the solar wind. If you could stand on Mars today, you would find a landscape of lifeless desolation. Very cold and very dry. But on Earth, things are going in a very different direction. Ice and snow are melting at rates we've never seen before. In Greenland, time-lapse cameras captured a 23-square-mile chunk of the Jakobsavn Glacier breaking off. The Greenland ice sheet is melting. If the whole ice sheet were to melt, sea levels could rise 20 feet. As the level rises, low-lying coastal areas will submerge. The city of New Orleans could be gone. But we can change this if we step up to limit the greenhouse gases we're producing. As human beings, we need to start to consider ourselves more and more as crew members of this Earth, not passengers, you know, nobody gets a free ride. You have a responsibility to take care of your fellow crewmates, just like we do on the space station. It's more difficult to do it when you're talking about billions of people, but that's really the mindset that we have to work towards. A new crew has arrived at the station. Two Russians, Gennady Padelka and Mikhail Korienko, and an American, Scott Kelly. The mission for both Scott and Mikhail is to spend a full year here so researchers can study how they're affected by long-term space travel. Scott is soon providing data for his study. 
one of the more recent discoveries in terms of the effects of weightlessness on human physiology is the effect that it has on our eyes. Um, several crew members, long duration crew members in the past have reported it a um, worsening of their eyesight while they were up in space. ISS Espresso, uh, it's this uh, space espresso machine, uh, which was developed in Italy, and uh, we actually, for the first time, could enjoy a good espresso in space. So, welcome change. I'm actually going to try and drink it out of this uh, zero-G cup, see what happens. Very much an experiment, but it would be a lot nicer if I get to drink my espresso from an actual cup instead of from a pouch. Let's see. They've set about a special project which will be very important when people take longer journeys to other planets. The best results are produced in this pink light. Without soil, the crew is attempting to grow their own crops. Chell Lindgren, an American medical doctor, inspects wow. the progress. Veggie was an amazing experiment, not only because we got to to grow this plant in space, he wants lettuce. but we also got to eat it. Chell's crewmate, Kimi Yayui, is from Japan. Well, I know that I enjoyed the lettuce. I think Kimi is not a big fan of vegetables. His father is actually a lettuce farmer. And so I think he's had a lot of lettuce. Happily, fresh food is about to arrive, this time on the Japanese HTV resupply ship. We are approaching England and its great capital, London. Across the English Channel to the right is France and the glorious city of Paris. Europe lies beyond. During the daytime, it's kind of hard to tell that people are on Earth. You don't see that much evidence of humanity. But at night, the same view tells a different story. It's easy to see how populated our planet really is, and how many of us have gathered in towns and cities. Now you can spot famous cities like Amsterdam, Brussels, the capital of Russia, Moscow. The vibrant cities of Japan, Osaka, Nagoya, and Tokyo. Beloved Rome and Naples. Italy at night is, is, is very moving because it's incredibly bright. It's, it's a densely populated country, of course, and so you can really see all the cities and, and you have this very distinct shape that you can very definitely see at night as well of, of this boot uh, reaching into this darkness of the Mediterranean. <laughs> this is just overwhelmingly beautiful. The undulating ribbon of light the Nile River, illuminated by people drawn from the desert to its water. Cairo gleams like a jewel in the Delta's crown. To the left, Israel and the cities of Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. I think one of the most amazing sights I saw with my eye was coming across the southern United States, Florida, into the Caribbean Sea, through the Bahamas, at night with a full moon and you could literally, you could see the colors, the aqua colors in the Bahama area, all the way down into, you know, through Cuba, and then uh, Dominican Republic, Haiti, on into Puerto Rico, and then the Virgin Islands beyond that. Oh my goodness. Fishing boats really stand out at night, especially in Asia, in the Andaman Sea, and near Thailand, there's a bunch of green fishing boats. During the day, you can't tell there's people in the ocean down there, but at nighttime, there's lots of folks fishing, you can, you can see that. 
I can see where I was born. Murfreesboro looks like a little diamond below Nashville. North of that, Louisville. Of course, Indianapolis, just, just beyond there. Pittsburgh. And then looking to the left, you can see the Great Lakes and, of course, the cities of Green Bay, Chicago. You can see Cleveland, Evident, Buffalo. And then up, further up the East Coast, coming to Richmond, Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York. Uh, Long Island sticks out, just, just absolutely gorgeous. Boston, Cape Cod, very visible, just absolutely beautiful. And then, of course, the cities across the border, Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, Quebec City. Astronauts often remark that you don't see any national borders from space. But there are exceptions. The strand of orange light dividing the view is the border separating Pakistan from India. We wish that there weren't issues, but there are. We have different ideals and different mindsets, and, and it causes us to have the border. That is sad. The most noticeable border at night is between North and South Korea. Seoul, South Korea is one of the brightest, most vibrant cities on the planet. The whole South Korean country is lit up. And then there's this line of the border in this complete darkness of North Korea with a few little white lights where Pyongyang is. But there's a similar number of people on both sides of the border. And you can really see the difference uh, between how people live. By moonlight, the Gulf of Mexico and the great cities of Dallas, Houston, and San Antonio. The landscape around them is ablaze with thousands of oil and gas flares. To meet our ever-increasing energy needs for the future, we'll have to develop new energy sources on a far larger scale. And one of them is our own sun. As the space station crosses its face, from 250 miles below, you can see the solar panels that provide its power. Here on Earth, we must go beyond capturing the sun's rays and learn how to create energy the way the sun does, by nuclear fusion. The challenge is to build a fusion reactor that will provide enough power for all our needs. If you can figure out how to reproduce this, you can create immense amounts of power and leave no pollution. Our sun also bombards us with lethal radiation. Without protection, most living creatures cannot survive it. But our Earth has a magnetic field which deflects the harmful particles away from us. The aurora shows that shield in action. planet of life.
struck me looking at Earthworm's face is the fact that you can really perceive it visually as a, as a spacecraft. I've heard before about, you know, spaceship Earth, but when you are up there, you really cannot escape that notion. It's totally obvious that it is a, a celestial body that is carrying all of us, all of humanity, all of life on Earth on this journey through space. And just like the space station is, you know, a human-made um, outpost out there that allows us to survive in this hostile environment of space, well, you know, our Earth does the same for all of us. I can imagine, of course, a future in which uh, human beings are able to travel to other star systems. So I, um, I, I really hope that at some point there, there will be a, a, a breakthrough in, in science and technology that will allow us to, to travel faster than light and actually explore different star systems. Don't you wonder sometimes, are there planets around other stars? Could they have life? Though we can't yet travel to the stars ourselves, our telescopes can. Astronomers have already discovered several thousand planets. We're searching around stars for the perfect conditions, not too hot, not too cold, for liquid water to exist. We call this the Goldilocks Zone. We can detect a planet as it crosses in front of a star, blocking its light. This is one system we found, Kepler-186. It's 500 light years from Earth, and it contains a remarkable five Earth-sized planets. Most important of all, the outermost planet, Kepler-186f, is just the right distance from its star for water and life to exist. Could this be another Earth? In the end, it's about two things. It's about this great adventure of exploring, and then it's about understanding how the world works and expanding the possibilities of what we human beings can do. And we can do great things together. If we all do our part for our children and great-grandchildren, our Earth will always be a beautiful planet.